This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. Hi, John McElroy here. Thanks for joining us on AutoLine this week. Today, we're going to be talking about the huge changes taking place in the retail end of the market. And that's because my special guest for today is Mary Ann Keller. She had an illustrious career on Wall Street. In fact, for a dozen years in a row, she was voted one of the top three analysts on Wall Street. She's also served on the boards of directors of many different retailers. And Mary Ann, it's so good to have you on the show here. Delighted to be here, Sean. Also joining me today, Steve Finley, my friend and colleague who knows more about the retail end of the business than anybody else I'm aware of on the media side of the business. Steve, great to have you on here. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Marianne, it, it's amazing what happened in the auto industry last year. A pandemic, the industry shut down for eight weeks, people stopped buying, but then the market came back. And all of a sudden, we noticed that all the dealerships and all the publicly traded retailers were making record profits. I think one of the reasons is they were operating on so much less inventory that they didn't have to offer any kind of discounts. And there was a number of other things going by. So my first question to you is, has the industry learned a lesson here? Can car makers and car dealers operate on less levels of inventory? Do you think they'll do that? <laughs> well, car dealer, uh, car uh, auto companies um, have a long history of uh, lack of discipline when it comes to this. And they'll always have models that, um, you know, are not as popular as the fully kitted out uh, Silverado. Uh, so they'll always be uh, excess supply someplace. But right now the industry is working on, you know, the, the fact that it's been tough to get started. The supply chain has, has had its problems right now. We have the microchip shortage uh, and so the auto companies are allocating all of these, the, 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 the parts that are, are, are in short supply um, to their highest profit vehicles, among other things. But, uh, you know, even pre this, this particular era event, um, the dealers were carrying significantly less inventory. And so for them, you know, variable costs are a very important part of whether or not the, the store is very profitable or just moderately profitable. Um, they had they spent much less money on floor plan. They had fewer cars to carry, but the interest rates were also much lower. They got deals from their vendors, especially in marketing. Um, they, of course, right size their staffs to the level of activity in the store. Uh, and, you know, cars are going to always be bought when they're needed by, uh, by the potential buyer. And, you know, eight weeks of cars, uh, dealerships being closed doesn't mean that the need for the car or the desire for the car ha hasn't, uh, has changed or has been fulfilled with some other uh, product. Uh, so as soon as people could come back into the stores, they started to come back either on a digital basis or virtual purchases or back into the stores themselves. So I think, you know, this was a different recession or, or in, uh, impact on dealers than it was in 2008 and nine, when it was all about a, a recession, a severe recession, higher interest rates, uh, dealerships closing because banks closed and they lost their floor plan. Um, this is this is one that, you know, is understandable and hopefully has a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so all of that demand is still going to be there. Uh, it's just been delayed. And, but, and so, what's so let really me put good you on, now is front end Let me profits. put you on the, the spot, though. I mean, it, it's great to have all this inventory and dealers want to sell whatever they can to whatever customer walks through the door. They love having that inventory. The automakers love it. They want to get as much market share. They're predicated on scale. Their manufacturing operations are predicated on scale, but they're making more money than they ever have before per unit, both OEM and uh, and dealer. So I, I, I come back to the question, do you think they're going to learn this lesson and say, look, let's go after the profits instead of just market share? I, 
I doubt it. Um, I think another another factor in the profits is the fact that when they have parts shortages, they allocate those parts to their most profitable vehicles. They're not going to, you know, uh, put uh, a scarce product like a microchip in something that's going to sell for thirty thousand dollars. They're going to put it in something that's going to sell for sixty or seventy thousand dollars. So that also impacts both dealer profits and. Um, uh, and also the automaker's profits. You make a lot more money on a well-equipped uh, pickup truck than you do on a, you know, a moderately priced CUV. So I, I think right now we also have to look at the portfolio mix that the dealer is carrying and the auto companies are producing, and that's ha that's a factor. And eventually things will broaden out. The supply chain will restore itself. Uh, and they'll be building their more of their portfolio and more of mo moderately priced, even though today's cars are very are are pushing up against you know the average price being in the high thirties. Um, one would one would say that that's that's a, a challenge for more families, especially if interest rates on loans go up. Well, my question is that you, you're seeing the uh, high demand. Uh, uh, and and the low inventory, and you know we all know what that means. Um, this and the low inventory was for various reasons, but it has resulted in dealers making more money. They're discounting less. The OEMs are putting fewer incentives on the, on vehicles. So it's all good, except if somebody uh, as a consumer can't find the vehicle they're looking for. If they're in the market for a pickup truck, they're gonna, they're gonna have some work on their hands versus if they're looking for a, a small sedan. So um, you wonder if um, the the lean inventory will be the way it, uh, of the future and, you know, stick uh, versus the, the American way of buying cars, which uh, Americans love heretofore anyways, to go on to a lot filled with acres and acres of vehicles and and pick one out in europe they think that's crazy but here that's the way we do business and we sell a lot of cars here but but i'm just wondering if um if those inventory levels will ultimately go back to the high levels they once were i you know the dealers that i talk to expect that they will mm -hmm. uh, and and I would say that's well, probably what's going to happen. You know, somebody's going to have a, a hot model here. Well, you're going to wind up with, you know, the comp competition, you know, doing something to rev up their sales. Um, one of the things that has also contributed to dealer profitability has been a uh, significant increase in the uh, number of used cars that dealers are selling. That's become the affordable car for the middle class family today. And um, and dealers, you know, have taken this opportunity uh, to really understand that market, to be more conscientious about uh, having a greater and uh, inventory that is reflective of their uh, their customer base. And I think their their commitment is not just going to be through through this pandemic period. I think it's a permanent commitment. Um, I'm on the board of Auto Canada, and the same thing is happening in Canada. Uh, we see dealers, including all of our own dealers, dealerships, having more used car inventory in some cases than we have new car inventory because the buyers are looking for something that they can afford that meets their needs. And it's, it's in many cases, it's not the $60,000 pickup truck. It's the pickup truck with 50 or 60,000 miles on it. That's going to be the workhorse for the family. Uh, and so um, we've actually acquired at Auto Canada a, a major used car dealer, independent used car dealer uh, in Canada, uh, because our intention is to build out um, a group of used car stores uh, in that country. And I see dealers thinking more about that. Uh, you know, Sonic today has done very well, largely because of its used car brand. Uh, where it's making a huge amount of money. And it did that not because they developed Echo Park inside the company. That was not a success because they went out and they bought dealers who knew what they were doing and were able to think in terms of 
uh, you know, having lots with hundreds of cars on it and providing the kind of customer service that uh, was expected. So I think I think the franchise industry has learned a lesson that they cannot ignore the used car customer, that they can make a decent profit on used cars because they're buying them themselves. There's lots of ways to buy a car. We have appraisals that so will buy your car today, you know, avoid the auction and the auction fees and have an inventory on your lot tomorrow. So dealers have gotten the tools today are available and the and the desire is there to be sure that they're selling at least one new to every use, one used car to every new car they sell. Uh, Marianne, you know, Wall Street also likes this because, you know, when I look at the market capitalization of AutoNation, the largest retailer in the United States, it's nearly $7 billion. Penske Automotive is almost $5 billion. I'm looking down here at my notes and Carvana, which only sells used cars. I don't even know if they make any money. They're valued at $50 billion, mm -hmm. way more than the other two. Right. So clearly Wall Street must like the, 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 the whole idea of selling. There's a lot to like there. Um, well, one of the yeah, things you is you're not hand tied by the OEMs. You can put any car brand in your, in your inventory that, that you think is going to sell and make a profit. The auto companies, you know, are to, uh, in a public sense, sometimes a disadvantage because you're limited to that brand. The success of that brand is going to determine the success of your portfolio. When I was on the board of Lithia, when they had a large number of Chrysler products, this was before 2009. And uh, needless to say, that was something that limited the valuation of the company. So, uh, the, the beauty of the used car market in a retail setting is you can sell anything, any brand, any make or model, because as used cars, there's a complete dis disconnect with your franchise dealership brand, except in the context of CPO cars. So there's a lot of, of flexibility in that business. Nobody's going to tell you you can't have a store here. You could put up a store if you want a store to sell used cars. Um, you don't have to ask permission. <laughs> you can buy a used car store if you want it. You don't have to ask permission of, uh, you know, you have my, do I have too many Toyota stores in a region or something like that? No, go buy a, you put up a used car store and buy a lot of used Toyotas. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, have, it's a more flexible industry in many, many ways. And I think franchise dealers today are recognizing the attributes of that industry, but also the need because their customers, unless they're all Mercedes brands, don't have the money today to often buy the car they need. And, and buying a used car with lots of protections and warranty protections around them are is an, is an important factor in this for well, dealers, them. Dealers and we know that used cars used, last long. Dealers yeah. love selling used cars. There's the, a higher profit margin, and and unlike new cars, every used car is different. Mm -hmm. uh, but every used car starts out as a new car, so you know what the the, the supply often. Uh, is tied to how many vehicles were made a couple of years ago that are now used cars on the lot. But dealers will use uh, uh, the, the latest software tools to find out demand in their market for what particular vehicles, used cars and new cars, uh, you know, right down to the color and right down to the region. So they're stocking what customers want and they're making uh, more money on it than they are in terms of a profit margin on new cars. But the sort of the tipping point is if they sell too many used cars, then they have the manufacturers breathing down their necks saying like, <laughs> wait a minute, what's going on here? So that's why you create there's a separate always a dynamic chain, a separate chain of used car stores. Well, every and dealer isn't in a position to do that, but you're right. That is a, a, the optimal thing to do. You know, we've been focusing on retailers right now, but I'm I'm curious about all these EV startups, notably started with Tesla, who did an end run around the franchise dealership and went direct to consumers. All the other startups that are coming to market now, are none of them are talking about going through the franchise dealership uh, network. They're talking about direct sales too. So Marianne, 
Uh, do you think this is going to work? The direct sales model, is this the future or what? I don't think it's going to work. And I don't think that anybody should believe that what Tesla has done is a completely digital, you know, no, uh, no assets it's model. They have a call center. You have to wait for your car. You have to have the car delivered. You have to go to a service center. Uh, they did close their their store on Greenwich Avenue um, early in the pandemic, uh, but they have locations in malls. They're all over the place with physical locations. So, I mean, when when Elon Musk announced that he was going to go digital only and shut down everything, he discovered that he had leases. Uh, and, um, and so he has people, he has lots of employees, he has lots of physical locations, he has to service his cars. So you have to have, as there's more of them on the road, you're going to have to have more physical locations to service those cars. So it's not, you know, so, so he owns all of those employees and he owns all of those locations. How is that different than what a dealer would do? And the dealer is the is the the buffer between the factory and the customer. Uh, provides good service. Is there a, a profit margin that he's kept? I don't see it in his earnings. You know, the idea is well, the dealer takes up money. The dealer has, you know, I have to pay the dealer uh, for marketing his cars, etc. Well, Tesla was very lucky because. They got you know billions of dollars of free publicity and still do, but every other brand is not Tesla, and they're going to have to market them. They're going to have to show them. A lot of people are not going to buy them until they see them or drive them. It's going to be a lot tougher for them because they don't have something somebody who is as charismatic uh, and controversial as Elon Musk. So well, um, that's where dealers come in is to do those things. And I think he said, I, I don't know if he still holds to this, but he, he said when Tesla gets big enough, they, they will consider having franchise dealers. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a dealer last week, Wes Lutz uh, from Jackson, Michigan, who was the former NADA chairman. Um, and he said dealers, the challenge for dealers with, as you say, all these startups coming in looking at the Tesla model of factory direct sales, the, the challenge for dealers is to prove their competitive advantage. They're the experts at selling cars. And it's interesting because the auto industry years ago created the franchise system. The, fr the franchise dealers didn't create it, the auto industry did because they didn't want to carry a national inventory. They didn't want to uh, maintain a national sales force and they didn't want to own a stores across the country uh so they 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 farmed it out to dealers mm -hmm. and it, right. it's worked pr pretty well i mean there were some days where dealers weren't were doing a great job representing their brand but those days are pretty much over i think it's hard to you have to really look hard to find a bad dealer now, some people will have their horror stories about a dealership but most people if you look at like star ratings on uh google or or, or any place where there's a recommendation or, you know, a re review of a dealership, they usually get four to five stars. So mm -hmm. they're doing something right. It's, it's very interesting that you say that. And dealers are very adaptable in terms of reaching out to, to consumers where they are. You know, nobody ever heard of Facebook Marketplace a few years ago. But today, <laughs> a dealer, most dealers are on Facebook Marketplace because and they've taught their salespeople, for example, to reach out to their customers and to, with specific cars that, they're, that they, they know they're looking for. It's, you know, the, the environment has completely changed. A bad dealer is going to be exposed very quickly. Right. Let, let's talk electric cars a moment here because electric cars don't need tune-ups. They don't need oil changes. Uh, they're coming with new electronics that allow for over-the-air updates where the, the car company can fix a, any kind of a problem in a car as long as it's uh, uh, software related. So what does that do to the, the back shop at dealerships, which is very profitable for service and maintenance and warranty? I think that it's not going to have a huge impact. 
when Elon, when Tesla first came to market, they had the Tesla Rangers who were going to come out to your house and fix your car. It was going to be, you know, a very smooth experience for the consumer. I, I think if they have a Tesla Ranger today, I, I don't think it's a free service. And what Tesla has wrestled with as it had more cars on the road was being able to provide service for people. You know, all of us have horror stories from friends who own a Tesla who say, you know, it took me X number of weeks to get a to get an appointment. Uh, the cars still need service. They still have uh, they still have wheels, tires, brakes, uh, shock, shock absorbers, absorbers, all kinds of things. Windshield things wipers. go bad in the car, and it needs to have a trained mechanic doing the work. Yeah, I don't think it matters if you're, it's an EV or a, a gasoline engine. If uh, the, the door switch doesn't work, <laughs> you're going to have to get that fixed, right? So uh, you're not going to be doing the mechanical work on EVs that you would be doing uh, on a, a, an electric, I mean, uh, internal combustion engine. But, um, you know, a dealer was telling me, you know, transmission work, that used to be, you know, bread and butter of our service department. You know, they, no, you know, they... they the, the industry has kind of solved the transmission issue. So those don't re require the repairs, they, the expensive repairs too, that they used to. Um, but the, yeah, there'll be a, a switch, but I don't think it would be a, a significant one because you know nothing lasts forever, including EVs. Where, where do you all see uh, the whole dealership experience going? Because when the pandemic hit, dealers, as you both have pointed out, are very flexible. They're very innovative. They're very creative. They figured out ways to give people peace of mind to come shopping for cars again. But they also started doing a whole lot more online. And now they're taking that deeper and deeper and deeper. Toyota just launched a, a program called Smart Path, where you can do 100% of the transaction online Never have to go to the dealership. They'll even deliver it to your house. Marianne, wh where do you see this all taking the retail end of the business? Well, I think you're going to see a lot more digital processes in the dealership. I, I mean, that, that is absolutely inevitable. Uh, you will always have people who want to see the car before and sit in it before they buy it, uh, which is logical. You see how tall you are and you see where the, where the blind spot is. <laughs> uh, and if the seat's comfortable. Uh, but there's going to certainly be more done online. I mean, we've all learned a lot of things from this pandemic. We've been at home looking at our computers, buying everything from Amazon and others. Uh, and so a part of it, certainly the search part and the, dis the discovery of which, you know, between which of these two pickup trucks do, do I really want to, which one do I want to buy? What dealers have told me is, yes, people will start and go farther into the process through that purchase journey, but they still want to see the car. And more often than not, that is when they come to do all of the final paperwork and take take delivery. But they still want to see it before they actually own it. Um, one part of the purchase process that is still difficult for most of the companies that are in this space or you know, offering this service to dealers um, is the F&I process. And the auto companies, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to keep up with the promotions that the auto companies might be offering on this model, but not that model, or being, um, or because you are a recent graduate or you're military or you have, a, you know, American Express black card, whatever it might be, uh, there's always little hidden benefits that, that a dealer uh, might be able to offer a, a particular customer because he, he, is, he works someplace, he's government, whatever it might be. And those things change all the time. And so, you know, being able to send out your credit uh, file out to a bunch of lenders, they, we've been able to do that for a long time. It's, it's being able to negotiate on your behalf. It's being able to look at what might else what else might be available for you. So I, I th there are parts of the process that are that are very, very hard to automate and still have not been automated. You know uh, and F and I the selling of F and I products and services. Um, 
Th that that is a challenge to do that online. Now, what you can do online is familiarize the customer with the products and yes. services with videos or whatever, so that when they do go into the F and I office, they're familiar with the product. And conventional wisdom is when people are familiar with the product, they're more likely to, to buy the product. And there's also less time spent at the F and I office, and then in general spent at the dealership that's has been an issue through the years is like how long does it take to sell a car well that's being cut down and a lot of the reason is because of the the digital auto retailing that right. unwittingly started you know during the pandemic as a uh, you know, mm -hmm, right. you know, back door play to, when these all these dealerships were closed. So you can do a lot online with auto retailing that benefits both the customer and the the retailer. But there's there's some things that are harder to do than others. That's right. I, I'm afraid we're down to the very end here. It's been a fascinating discussion with the two of you. And, you know, I, I thought we would end up discussing about all oh, the retail end of the business, a lot of uncertainty and all. What you're saying is the future looks pretty bright. And that, that's my takeaway from this discussion. Dealers are, are very innovative. They figure out how to make money. They figure out how to satisfy the customer. Looks to me like they're not going away anytime soon. Marianne Keller, thanks so much for your time today. Great to have Thank you, you on the show. And Steve, great having you back as well. Yeah, pleasure. And as I always say, I wanna thank all of you for having tuned in. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode.